I've been asked to speak this morning on training in righteousness. Training in righteousness. Now we're going to look at three texts quickly. Uh, the last, the main text will be the last one, and then we just move on from there. So Hebrews 5, verses 11 to 14. Hebrews 5, verses 11 to 14. It says, there is much more we would like to say about this, but it is difficult to explain, especially since you're spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. First Timothy chapter four from verses seven to eight. First Timothy chapter four from verses seven to eight. Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. And then the last one, which is our main text, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verses 10 to 17. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. But the Lord rescued me from all of it. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and impostors will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. But you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. In the first bit of the last uh, text we read, we didn't read that, uh, chapter 10, or chapter 3, beg your pardon. The first bit of it, it talks about, you know, Godlessness in the last days, you know, and uh, talked about you know all kinds of things that people will be involved in. You know, people will be ungrateful, disobedient to parents, you know, and you know all sorts, which we see today, you know, in increasing measure, and that people will scoff at God. And while it's the manifestation of the sinful nature, which is, you know, 
evidently clear. I see something else there. I see a people that are entitled. Entitled people. And uh, I want to offer an advice, if I can, here. That no man owes you anything. Nobody owes you anything. Nobody owes me anything. God owes no one nothing. It's very important because it helps to manage expectations. God owes no man nothing. He's done what he needs to do, and that's it. The fellow out there doesn't owe you any. He himself is hustling. So you've got to take responsibility. I have to take responsibility. But you owe yourself something. And I owe myself something. And it's the truth. We owe ourselves the truth. Jesus is the truth. Seek the truth. Love the truth. Embrace the truth. We owe ourselves that one. As a man, I uh, listened to, you know, I listened to a message some time ago uh, from Dr. Miles Morrow. He's, he's pastor now, bless memory. And uh, as I was preparing for this meeting, I, I felt God was saying I should, you know, say a few things from what I heard him say at that, uh, uh, the sermon he preached. The first thing he says, he says, you must lead with your life. You must lead with your life. Then he says that your life is the weight of your words. But I've added something there. I said your life, my life, is the weight of our words and our actions. And he says something else. He says, never trust a salesman who doesn't use what he's selling. He's selling something and he's not using it. You don't trust him. And he says, he says, there is nothing like personal life or private life. It's nothing like that. He says you must quit saying what I do in private is none of your business. You must quit saying that. I must quit saying that. Because what we do in private is our business. What you do in private is our business. What I do in private is your business because that will determine whether you will trust what I say publicly. We can't be doing something privately and then outwardly or publicly we're doing something else. Interestingly, in this uh, chapter 3, verse 10. Training in righteousness. Paul was speaking to Timothy. But well, Paul starts with himself. Strangely. He begins to appraise himself in the presence of Timothy. And I think that that is where we should start. 
We should start with ourselves first. Because training in righteousness is a two-way street. You know, somebody is giving, somebody is receiving. But at times, even the person who is giving is also receiving somewhere. But let us start with ourselves. So Paul started with himself. He told Timothy, he says, you know what I teach and how I live. You know. Which means that it was in full glare. There was nothing secret about what Paul was doing. He says, you know. In other words, whatever we are saying must match what we are doing. Yeah, I don't know whether you are feeling the I'm feeling the heat here. I don't know about you. You know, because every time God gives us time, He's giving us opportunities. To write some things, to change some things. That you are, you've, God has allowed us to enter into 2023. Don't take it for granted, my brother, my sister. That's why I start by saying that you owe yourself and I owe myself the truth. Nobody should tell. I call yourself to a meeting. Because this is serious stuff. He says, you know what I teach and how I live. You know it. And you know that whatever it is that we are doing, we are teaching. It's not until one comes out here Whatever it is that you are doing, you're already teaching. Jesus began to do and to teach. He says, Timothy, you know. You know what I teach. You know how I live. What are you teaching? Don't worry. God is only speaking about this so that we can adjust, make reasonable adjustments. What are you teaching at home? Many times we assume that the, the, the teachers are the ones who are supposed to do the work. No, of course, they have their own role. But what about us? What are we teaching in the office? Timothy didn't just know what Paul was teaching and how he was living. He says, you know the purpose for my life. That's Paul speaking to him. And of course, we know the purpose. We know Paul's purpose in life. It was only one purpose, to please Jesus. You know, we've been, I don't know who was talking about, I think it was the edge, I don't know. Who was talking about motive. I don't know where, from two weeks back. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I doing it for him, to please him? Or am I doing to please others? So we have to go back and check the motive for what we are doing. Maybe we need to rejig what you have done or what you are about to do. Will it be pleasing to him? That's the question we should be asking ourselves. Would it please him? If it won't please him, 
then reconsider. Yet, Paul made it clear so that you know my purpose. Second Corinthians 1, 17 to 19. It says, you may be asking why I changed my plans. It was Paul now speaking. Do you think I make my plans carelessly? Do you think I am like people of the world who say yes when they really mean no? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Silas, beg your pardon, Timothy and I preach to you. And as God's ultimate yes, he always does what he says. Again, Paul started with himself. And yet Timothy could see all this in full view. So, training was going on already. Then Paul went on to say, you know my faith. And of course, we know, you know, the conversion story for, you know, Saul turned Paul on the way to Damascus. We know that. But a little digression here. You know, everyone who is a sinner is guilty before God. Everyone that is a sinner is guilty before God. We look at sin as, you know, lying, stealing, and all those kind of things that, you know, are associated. Again, those are manifestations. The sin itself is rebellion against God. That's what sin is. Rebellion against God. Let the police stop you tomorrow and ask you to enter their car. You say you're not going to go. You, you can't. You can get to the station and you guys can be sorting it out there whether it's right or wrong. But at the point when he's asking you to do something, you have to. And yet, the one who is the creator of the ends of the earth, we're scoffing at him. Huh? Rebellion again. He woke you up this morning. So it is very serious, this issue of rebellion. And this year, no, we don't, we're not cajoling anybody. You embrace the truth for yourself. Everybody is working out their own salvation. You've got to work out yours. Because the stakes are too high. Because what sin does is that it leads to eternal separation. It is serious stuff. It's like a man who is writing an exam. Once they say pens up, that's it. You can't submit your paper to the interviewer, the invigilator, and then you ask, no, no, you finished, you finished. There's also a pens up. When you are called from there, that's it. But you have time now. You have time. Once they say pens up, even one P you can't take with you. Oh, you know better than I do. Make peace with Jesus. What are you enjoying? That is a barrier to your eternity? Come on. I 
and God loves you. I've been reading the book of Jeremiah recently. I feel the ache. It's just what I'm reading. I feel God's ache. I said, does he even sleep? Of course, we know he doesn't sleep. He says, go and meet them again. Go and talk to them. Go and do. He's just, he just wants to save us. Can we not understand what he's saying? God with undeserved kindness, kindness that we don't deserve, God declares us righteous by virtue of the sacrifice of Jesus. With all that you have done, and I have done, God is saying that you are, and nobody can take him to court. That's his verdict. You are righteous. That's what God says. You got right standing before him. Regardless of what you have done, my, oh, my. I don't have time, but I've told you the time they towed my car because I didn't pay a parking fine. No, no time today, maybe another day. I thought it was a joke. I was new in the country. I thought it was uh, where I was coming from. The thing kept on coming and I kept on throwing it out. Maybe they will forget. Forget what? Just woke up one morning, the thing wasn't there again. I won't tell you the figure. No, the they, they penalty, they, they're not joking. Oh, God says, I want to cancel everything you have done while there is time. Oh, what do you need to do? They've been thinking about it today. Pastor has talked about it. It's not a, a it's not a rehearsal. We didn't know what is planning anything. But the stakes are too high, my brother. And as we are getting older, we must be getting wiser. Repent of your sins. Acknowledge that you are a sinner. Stop saying that I'm good. You are not good. No one is good. And then put your trust in him. And follow him. What is too hard in that? But I find out that faith is not a one-off thing. It's an ongoing thing. It's not as if, oh, uh, I have faith. No, no, no. And we use faith in different contexts, which is great. You know, I'm believing God for this. Great. I do that as well. But faith could be more than that. Faith is first of all about believing in him. Secondly, it's about obeying him. You can't do one of the two. And thirdly, whatever you are doing must be bringing glory to his name. That's faith. So you've got to look back and look inwards. Am I really a man of faith? Can I ask a question, please? Can a man be a man of faith or a woman of faith? and yet not walk in love. So the things that Paul was saying, 
fundamentals. He says, you know my faith. You know my patience. You know my endurance. You know my love. And truly, Paul was a man of faith. He believed, he obeyed, and he brought glory to his name. Equally a man of love. You know, he's talking about very fundamental issues. Because at times, we say we're people of faith and there's no love. Yet the one that we're submitting to is love. What an irony. The one you say, or I say that I believe in, and I'm obeying, and I'm bringing, he's love. And yet we don't. What does First John 3, 18 says? It says, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. It's not enough to profess. Faith expressing itself through we've got a lot of work to do. But thank God. It's a good work. And God will see us through in the name of Jesus. I see similarity between Jesus, his style, and Paul. In the sense that Jesus was always upfront with his disciples, was always sharing with them. He says, in this world, you will have tribulations. He told them, up front. He didn't want any surprises for them. But be of good cheer. He says, the son of man will be beaten, will be arrested. He told them ahead of time. For some of the things he told them, after he, you know, he had risen up, they were saying, and he told us this. And he told us this. Paul speaking to Timothy. And we have to do the same thing, warning him that anyone that will live a godly life will face persecution. We need to prepare the young ones. We need to let them know. But Paul said, you can see that God rescued me. The faithfulness of God. But we've got to prepare them. And for young people who are here, please listen. When you get your parents talking to you and your teachers talking to you and, you know, uh, your teachers in Alleyway and Atoms and all those places, After Paul had finished doing an appraisal, then he moves to Timothy. You know, it's a two-way game. He had given his own account. You know this, you know that, you know this, you know that, you've seen this in my life. Then he moves to him straight. And he says to him, be faithful to what you have been taught. I think it's in verse 14 here. He says, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true. 
for you know you can trust those who taught you. What we do matters. So Paul used the first part to give an account and to say, you know what? You know these things are true. You know that I have lived my life based on the word of God. And right before your eyes, things are happening. We're getting results. It's working. So, remain faithful. But that faithful that he's talking about is that apply. Don't let it remain in your head. We know too many things that we don't apply. And I believe God is saying to us today that there were certain things that we were doing before. We stopped doing them. It's all about who goes to school for four years doing engineering and then they're asking, he's just talking head knowledge. So apply the thing you learned. Apply. Because if you don't apply, you won't get the results. And God helps us in this assembly. So much information. If I become like constipation. But you have to apply. I have to apply. Or else what's the point? Remain faithful. To the things that you have. So that's the reason why they are teaching us. So that we can. You can trust those who are teaching you, like Paul. I hope people can say of me that they can trust me. And I hope they can say that of you as well. Second thing that Paul ask him to focus on is the word of God. Focus on the word of God. It is able to make you wise unto salvation. Focus on the word of God. It teaches us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Focus on the word of God. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Focus on the word of God as God uses it to prepare and equip us to do every good work. But my mind went to one thing. Joshua 1.8. <laughs> my version says, this book of instruction. It's a book of instruction. So every morning you need to ask, have I been instructed today? It's a book of instruction. It says study. It didn't say read. Study. Study. Study this book of instruction continually. Not once a month. Not even once a week. Continually. Meditate on it day and night. That's where God begins to speak to us. So you'll be sure to obey everything. Be sure to obey everything. It's not partial. It must be everything written in it. Only then. Only then. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. So this must be priority. And God will help us so that we can manage our time well. We've got to read. We've got to find out what God is saying and do it. The last thing I want to share from here is relying more on the Holy Spirit. If you want to 
is someone who is being trained in godliness. Because there are certain things that happen on a day-to-day basis that you must know how to tackle. And I'll, I'll, I'll share something quickly. Someone did something for me. You know, I asked him to do something for me. And when he got back to me, I looked at the paperwork. I said, sir, is this thing correct? Ah, it's correct. He's an expert. I'm not an expert. And he explained it to me, this, 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 this. And I said, that's fine. And then, after a while, I began to express restlessness in my spirit about that thing that he did. I don't know. I'm not an expert. I don't know what exactly it is. But I was just troubled. So I called him. I said, sir, this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. And the guy, to be very patient. So he was on the phone. He sat me down. Discuss, 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 until I became okay. So I said, okay, you know, just being naive, I don't know, maybe it's just, you know. Few days after again, the thing started. I said, what's going on here? So when I couldn't continue it again, I called him. I said, I'm sorry. I said, because I don't know how these things work. You know, but I'm just not clear. He said, but I thought I explained to you. I said, yes, you did. Well, of course, I couldn't be telling him that, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm restless. I said, but I just, I'm not clear about this thing. Can you please explain to me again? And he sat down. He explained it to me. He referred me to a website. And I read it with my own eyes. And it looked okay. A few days after I went, the thing started. So I said, okay, Lord, you've got to really help me here. Because I don't know what's going on. Is it not written that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth? I began to pray. I said, Lord, you've got to show me. I don't know. I'm not an I don't know what to do. Then somebody called me out of the blues. And as we got talking, I remember that she's in that area as well. So I then said, excuse me, this is, ah, he said, don't go there. I said, I'm there already. <laughs> don't go where? I'm there or no wonder. No wonder the Holy Spirit kept on wrestling with me. And the guy, very eloquent, he will, there is no time I call him, he will pick up his phone. And he will explain, and he will explain. About to close now. We we'll go back to that issue again. Where are you going to spend eternity? Please, we're not here to kaju. We're just here to share the word of God. God loves you. And time is ticking. I don't know why God has brought you here today to hear this message. But if God has been speaking to you and you want to surrender your heart to Jesus today, there is nothing to be ashamed of. But We are going to be in this room here. This room by your right to my left. We're going to be there for 15 minutes. If God has been speaking to you and you need to surrender, please meet us there after the grace. God bless you. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We thank you for speaking to us again. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your patience. 
we thank you for your word. Lord, please, we want to respond. Forgive us our sins. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you for all that has been shared today. We pray that we, our response will please you. Glory be to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.